In this video, we're gonna be looking at pre versus post-workout protein supplementation. It wasn't that long ago that people actually thought if you didn't have your protein shake before your last rep on bicep curls, the anabolic window would shut and you'll lose all your gains. My good friend, Sir Alan of Aragon, Dr. Brad Schoenfeld and James Krieger actually done a study on this. So let's take a look. So this study was actually published on January the 3rd and this video is recorded on January the 4th, so if you want breaking news on all research, you need to subscribe to the channel. So, the title of the study was Pre vs Post Exercise Protein Intake Has Similar Effects on Muscular Adaptations. Well, you know that there's no difference now, so you can stop watching the video and go and watch some fluffy cats on YouTube. However, if you are an abstract artist, here is the abstract. I've highlighted some key things. You can take that, screenshot it, and then go and cherry pick everything. But no, we're going to go down, we're going to go down to the results section, get straight into it, Mr. Introduction, and we're going to get straight to the methods. So they had um, a pre-supplementation group and a post-supplementation group. The pre-group, there was actually nine subjects, and the post-group, there were 12 subjects. Now, what they got was if you was in the pre-supplementation group, you wasn't allowed to eat three hours after the workout and if you're in the post supplementation group you wasn't allowed to eat three hours prior to that workout so the actual study went uh, was 10 weeks long and they had three uh, training sessions per week the subjects were tested prior to the initial testing so on the the screen share you can see t1 t2 was the midpoint through the study so after five weeks and then they had another testing uh, after um, T3 after the actual 10 weeks of training took place and they measured body composition, muscle thickness and maximal strength. So a little bit more about the participants, they were 21 male volunteers, they were university population, average age was 22.9, 23 and uh, the subjects had no musculoskeletal disorders, they were all healthy, uh, they hadn't taken any anabolic steroids etc. And in regards to the actual supplementation itself, it was from Dimatized Nutrition, and they had a supplement, protein supplement, which had 25 grams of protein and just one gram of carbohydrate. So again, a decent amount of protein uh, post-workout uh, for some people this age is probably sufficient to maximize their muscle protein synthesis. So subjects in the pre-sup group, as we said, three hours they couldn't eat after, and the post they couldn't eat beforehand. So that, that was good because they controlled that factor and it is a big enough window um, where that wouldn't have an impact. So that was a really good thing. In regards to the resistance training, they performed nine exercises per session. Again, the subjects were instructed to refrain from any additional resistance training or additional aerobic cardiovascular type of tra training during the 10 week period. In regards to what they actually performed, so we know it was nine exercises, they performed at around 75% of their 1RM, which equated to a 10RM, and they actually did a 10RM testing to determine the actual loads for each individual prior to actually undertaking that training. And they worked between the eight to 12 repetition range. Uh, moving on, we can look at the dietary in intervention. So the, for them to maximize the anabolic response, each subject was given a dietary plan to equate to 1.8 grams per kilogram of their body mass, with fat equating to around 25 to 30% of total energy intake. So they were looking to actually be in a caloric surplus of around 500 calories plus per day. However, when we look a little bit further, did they actually adhere to that? Were they actually in a caloric surplus or did they not follow it? So a good thing as well is that they actually used MyFitnessPal. So it was self-reported food intake um, but they were using MyFitnessPal and they were analysing um, their MyFitnessPal and they were logging on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, yeah, recorded every single day, um, calculating their calories, protein, carbs and fats. You guys watching this, you know about MyFitnessPal, you know what they can do. So in regards to measurements, if you said they'd done it at the start, they'd done it midway through and at the end of the training. They looked at muscle thickness using ultrasound, so a very good method with good correlation coefficients. God, that sounded intelligent. Uh, measurements, um, they also measured body composition using DEXA scan, again, highly rated up there in regards to accuracy, well, to get the best reading. And they also measured uh, maximal strength in the bench press 
and a squat, the parallel back squat. I just want to put that in there. And the testing was 48 hours prior to the training, the T1 testing, and 48 hours post their last training session. So moving on, let's get into the results because that's what you come here for. So the actual number enrolled originally was 59, but that doesn't mean 59 people actually started training. It just meant 59 people got an email saying, would you like to take part in the study? 59 said yes. So after all of this, some people may think, well, that's quite high going from 59 to 21. However, it's not uncommon when it comes to actually carrying out research, especially with college age uh, subjects. Uh, those which did complete the, the 21, they had a attendance completion of 97.3%, so a very good rate there. Now we're gonna get into the nutrition. So you're gonna see here, there's gonna be p-value uh, effect over time and p-value effect from the groups. P-value effect over time is just basically, was there a difference from week zero, the start, to week 10? Was there a difference between muscle mass, uh, muscle thickness, strength, etc.? So if you see a p-value effect of time, that's that. If you see p-value effect of group, then that's a, a significant difference based on the group pre versus post. So just to clarify that, to clear that up. So I'm gonna go down to the table now. Now there was some interesting uh, results here. Now the groups actually was not in, they were not in a caloric surplus and we can see that. We're gonna look in just a little bit about uh, the actual protein intake, calorie intake, and what actually happens. So that's one big thing and the, the lead authors actually address that and they address a, quite a, a lot of the limitations of the study, which we're gonna see in just a little bit. But so a few things to look at here, like total fat mass, I'll just highlight it. So it, oh, it's not highlighting that well nicely now. Uh, total fat free mass for the pre and post, you can see the pre group went from 12.2 down to 11.8 um, and then 10.9. So that is a, a decent loss of fat mass over a 10 week period. Um, so it would have been a, a slight to a moderate deficit um, another thing which was a little bit weird when looking at the table is uh, the lean body mass. And this is one good thing we can take from the study. It, even though they were supposed to be on 1.8 grams per kilogram, it wasn't exactly because they increased their protein intake. Um, but it just showed that in a slight to maybe a little mo moderate deficit that they actually retained and actually put on a little bit of uh, lean lean muscle mass, etc. So yeah, one here, the, the pre-group went from 64.5 to 64.6, I increased slightly to 64.8. But for some reason, and it's a little bit weird, it's gone from the post-group, so in the first testing was 62.6 kilograms of total lean mass. It went up midway through to 65.1, and then it dropped back down to 63. So there's something there where I'm thinking, that's one thing which just highlights and it's just a little bit off. So it could have been a number of reasons. I don't know, it did go up and it dropped back down, but both groups actually lost fat mass and uh, maintained and just slightly increased uh, their lean mass a tiny bit. But you can see on the p-value, there's no significant difference based on the p-value for group. However, there are p-value for time in total fat mass, in body fat percentage, which makes sense. Their left arm for some reason, um, in regards to fat mass ends um, their left leg. So you can see that there, if you wanna look at that, you can pause it and carry on. But now we're gonna move on to the actual nutrition. Now, what I would have liked is rather than just seeing bar charts here, I would have actually liked to see um, the grams per kilogram. So what they were supposed to be on, 1.8 grams per kilogram, we know that they were on more, but what did that equate to overall? Was it two grams per kilogram? Was it 1.9? just to get sort of that range uh, and um, have an understanding of how much protein in a mild deficit do you need to maintain a lean, lean muscle mass. So as you can see, the pre-group, they actually dropped their calories. So this is one thing. They were logging on MyFitnessPal. And uh, I've spoken to Alan Aragon, Brad, and James about this when they come over for the PTC conference. They actually, um, I think, went through this. Uh, and I said, well, why are people looking at nutrition? Why wasn't their body weight? If they're doing MyFitnessPal, could they not track their body weight on the app? And then someone at the end of each week, like an online coach would, would look at that and be like, okay, your, your weekly average is going down. Your calories are going down. We can see that on the assessment. We need to up them. So actually having some coaching, counseling to um, 
you make sure they are in a surplus around about that 500 calories. And that may take a few weeks and then it may increase and stuff like that. So there's multiple factors. But you can see that both groups dropped their calorie intake. Um, pre actually increased it a little bit. The post supplementation group just dropped it and they kept it there. They were on higher protein in the first place. Uh, calories, sorry, this is calorie. Protein bit, just this bit here. Uh, as you can see, the protein intake went up. Um, again, it would be good to get the exact, but there's quite a significant difference in regards to um, protein for the pre-group and protein for the post-group. Went up a little bit and then it dropped back down. So there, there, was, there wasn't a consistency uh, on those. So just to finish up, Again, if you want the paper, it's in the link in the, the comment section and just the description should go through that. But to summarize this study, that anabolic window, what we saw earlier, they had a three hour gap pre and three hour gap post based on the groups. There was no significant difference, whether it's in a deficit, whether it's at maintenance. Again, it would be good to see these results when they are in a chronic surplus and see if there is any difference. That could be a, a, another study for another date. Um, but as it stands, there is no difference whether you have your protein shake at the start of your workout or protein shake at the end of your workout. So big rocks first. Get your calories, hit your protein targets, get training, and don't worry about popping that protein shake 10 seconds after your bicep curls. If you like the video, hit like. If you haven't subscribed, come on now. I'm not asking again, even though I am.